Before we get started, just a reminder that you can find all of my available rental properties on my website at markguzman.com. If you own investment property, click on the owner services section to see our complete list of services. This episode and wine tasting is sponsored by Lanny Clark with Prime Lending. Lanny Clark is a loan officer specializing in residential home lending. He communicates with you every step of the way and his honesty sets him apart from the rest. He's able to think outside of the box due to his experience and is able to tailor a loan program to fit your needs. If you can't qualify just yet, not a problem. He will let you know what you need to do in order to be ready. Lanny is also backed by Prime Lending, which is one of the biggest and fastest growing lending banks in the nation. They have simplified the home lending process down to five steps. And FYI, step number five is to relax and enjoy your new home. So contact Lanny Clark today at 510-964-0620. The Bay Area is a unique sports market with six different professional sports teams for fans to follow and root for. While much can be made about the Giants and 49ers in San Francisco, the city of Oakland has played a major role in crafting its own contributions to the history of Bay Area sports. Let us all set the change soon with impending moves of the Oakland Raiders and Golden State Warriors to Las Vegas and San Francisco respectively, on top of the ongoing saga of the Oakland A's stadium hunt. These moves are striking at the heart of Oakland sports fans who are some of the most loyal and passionate fans out there. Today our guest is Chris D. Benedetti, sports columnist for the East Bay Express to talk about the impact the East Bay's three teams have had on fans and the community and why these moves have the impact they do on fans. Uh, uh, we are recording, so if you guys want to start officially. Okay, yeah. perfect. Yeah, we'll start officially. Then. Okay. So Chris, thanks for coming on to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for Appreciate having me. Appreciate you coming out here. And before we jump into it, just want to thank Lenny Clark with Prime Lending. He's our wine sponsor. And we'll be tasting uh, William Hill Charnay. So hopefully you like white wine. I do. And uh, cheers. cheers. Thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. How do you like it? It's good stuff. It's pretty good. Yeah, I grew up in Sonoma County, so I'm kind of... Oh, you're used to it. <laughs> yeah, then. I got used to it. Um, but it's, it's good. Yeah. Yeah. What's your favorite wine out there in Sonoma? You know, um, oh, that's a great question. There's so many. Um, I grew up in Healdsburg, and Clos du Bois was always the big the big winery. I don't mm-hmm. know if there's many others, but um, that always... They make some good wines, they too. They do, yeah. And they always catch my eye when I'm at the store, and I'm going looking for a bottle. So Yeah. I, I want to say they had a... They were known back in the day for doing like some big marketing campaign with restaurants and Mm. making sure that their wine was at many restaurants on the table. Smart. Yeah. Smart marketing. So you currently work with the East Bay Express as their sports columnist. Right. And, and one thing I like to, one reason why I started this podcast is really to find out and interview local Bay area people, what got them into doing what they're doing. So what's your background? What's your origin story? How did you end up uh, in sports? Yeah, well, it was kind of a long route. Um, uh, I, I didn't really start with sports. And, and really, the, my first professional sports writing job um, where I wrote exclusively about sports is with East Bay Express in the last 16 months. Um, I started out with the, the old Alameda News Group, which ANG, which became the Bay Area News Group, which now is the Mercury News and East Bay Times used to be the Oakland Tribune before they changed the name. Um, but, um, and for years, I, c- I covered a wide range of things. I covered, you know, schools in East Bay, like in San Leandro, Castro Valley. I covered Fremont, the city of Fremont for a long time. Um, and I covered crime. Um, so there are all kinds of things. And occasionally I would cover, you know, I would cover like a, you know, if there was a playoff game, an ace playoff game, I'd, you know, I'd do that story in the parking lot where we talked to the fans. And so I, I occasionally wrote about sports, but it was always rare and it was always on the periphery. The one thing I covered was um, Fremont, uh, the A's trying to move to Fremont in 2006, 2007. Um, so I did cover that and I, of course, fell through. Um, but so uh, sports wasn't your original. Yeah. You know, it's always been my passion, but it was never what I was covering. OK. Full time. Um just in the last, you know, 16 to 18 months with East Bay Express, starting out in October of 2017. That's when I started doing this weekly sports column, which has been therapeutic more than anything. You know, like I started like, I want to celebrate Oakland sports was the goal. And now that the Warriors are leaving, the Raiders, you know, 
or, or have their eyes on Vegas and are probably leaving. Um, I feel sometimes like I'm writing the eulogy of Oakland sports, you know? Um, but um, Well, that's what's on our agenda. Okay. I mean, it's really just a lot of Oakland. I mean, there's a lot of things happening in Oakland. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, um, but going back to your origin story, so yeah. you've been working with East Bay Express 16 to 18 months now. Yeah. And I, I would imagine that's got to feel great to just be covering something that you're just passionate about. Yeah, no, that's true. It, it's, it's been great. Um, and uh, and also, too, it's a column, so I get to just give my opinions. You know, obviously, you want to back it up with facts. Yeah. Uh, but it's I can opine. And, and, and you know, uh, there is a little bit of a frustration I think every reporter has where, you know, if you don't have the goods, um, if you don't have, you know, the story locked down, you do really have to do this he said, she said thing. Um, uh, and uh, a lot of times objectivity is feigned, you know, because – these days, it just seems to be less and less uh, in a story. There's, there's, we're so polarized politically, uh, mm -hmm. and I think there's you know, in the sports world in the Bay Area. We're polarized. There's literally by a body of water and a bridge. You know, there's West Bay and East Bay, uh, and a little bit of South Bay. So, um, uh, what I've enjoyed about the about the column with the Express is that th there is no feigned objectivity. This is my opinion, and here's why I feel this way, and I can just kind of let it rip. Uh, and sometimes it's a thousand words, which would be really long for. Uh, daily newspaper column but sometimes it's 2500 words which is like a magazine piece and i appreciate the flexibility they give me to to let me do that so what happened for the transition to go from covering <laughs> what you were covering before including crime to yeah like sports well i left the i left the uh, east bay times um and at the time i think it was the tribune um i left and i i, I still work uh, i have another job uh doing uh, sort of like the pio for a non-profit agency in uh in the East Bay. So I, I do a little bit of both. I, I still I have this column in the East Bay Express, but I also um, sort of have a, another gig that helps pay the bills. Okay. So. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, let's get right into Oakland. I mean, a lot of news in yeah. Oakland. I, I mean, we're talking about a new uh, stadium for the Oakland A's. We're talking about Oakland Raiders moving. Yeah. And we're talking about the Warriors leaving – uh, Oakland. I yeah. mean, to be honest, I never thought the Warriors would ever leave Oakland. Right. But, um, I mean, let's start with the Warriors. I mean, does that move make sense for them? You know, it, it makes sense. And some people are going to think this is naive. But it makes sense if all you want to do is make a lot of money. <laughs> you know? One of my favorite quotes is from a movie from Citizen Kane where there's an old guy. He's like an old friend of, of uh, Charles Foster Kane, played by Orson Welles. And he goes, you know, making a lot of money isn't that hard to do if all you want to do is make a lot of money. Um, and maybe that's not true. Maybe it is more difficult. Otherwise, we'd see more billionaires. But I love the quote in the sense that it, it's saying, hey, there's something more at stake here, you know, and you should have a greater sense of balance. Um, I think the Warriors are going to really re regret this move. Maybe not next year. Maybe not in 2021. Um, but soon. The same way that Al Davis regretted going to Los Angeles almost immediately. The same way that for all the money the Niners are making in Santa Clara, um, they're way less relevant in Santa Clara. than and not, It's no knock on Santa Clara. It's just the way the stadium is set up. Well, I was just going to bring that yeah. up, that that would be my fear with the Warriors, is yeah. that they go to San Francisco, and the Warriors have always been an icon but a staple in Oakland, Yeah. right? Yeah. And then same thing like San Francisco Niners. They yeah. moved to Santa Clara – and I'm, I haven't really kept up with their financials, so I, I don't know. Right. I mean, do you know their financials? Are they doing pretty well or are they kind of suffering? Yeah, well, I think that they make they make more money because they own the building. Okay. So if Taylor Swift comes to play a concert, which isn't that frequent, but when she comes to play uh, a Santa Clara Stadium like she did a couple of years ago, they pocket a, a big chunk of money and they don't have to share very much with Santa Clara. Okay. Um, whereas in San Francisco, it's a different deal. Like, you know, they that was... San Francisco built that park, Candlestick, decades ago, late 50s, early 60s. And there was, you know, the Niners were more of a tenant uh, as to what happened at, at Candlestick Park okay. than they are at San, in Santa Clara at Levi's because they own the building. Um, and they set up, as all teams do, they set up this, this sweetheart deal where, you know, the, the, the municipality will own the building and thereby, uh, you know, they're responsible for the taxes and the insurance and that kind of thing. But the team pr profits, you know. 
Uh, it's like that old saying, you know, we, we social we make it socialism for for the rich, but we make it rugged individualism for the for the poor in the cities. Um, <laughs> you know, th that's that's how sports teams these days set it up. It's a sweetheart deal, and the Niners have done the same thing. That's why they've profited. The the Warriors are trying to do the same. They're going to do the same thing in San Francisco, and because it's San Francisco real estate, and they're going to have office space and housing and this and that, they're going to they're going to make big profits, and they're going to have concerts playing in San Francisco where they never used to because there was never a facility. Uh, in San Francisco in those days, so um, for decades now they do. And they're going to profit big time on that. But as a, as far as the Warriors go, it's it's going to hurt them. It's going to make them less relevant. It's going to make them less cool. The crowds will be less enthusiastic. In time, they'll be less numerous. Um, it's going to be all in all a lamer scene. And that's um, what happened with the Niners because that's exactly. I, I remember here in the East Bay, I live in Richmond, mm -hmm. but you would have a lot of diehard Oakland fans and a diehard Niner fans. Right. Now you don't see any of them, Yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah. But when the Niners made that move, you saw the diehard Niner fans just kind of disappear. Yeah. I, I think a lot of people just got discouraged that now you got to go to Santa Clara, much richer neighborhood. Yeah. You know, even though San Francisco is, you know, pretty high up there in yeah. income, yeah. but it, it was a, a different feel, different area. It's a staple of San Francisco. It's always been there. Yeah, yeah. And, and as, we can, as we've seen, you know, you better win because then things will change quickly and you're... You may ha you may be selling a bunch of tickets, but people won't get there as often. It's d like the Santa Clara uh, situation, Chase Center in San Francisco. It will be difficult to get to, um, and uh, you know Steph Curry is going to turn thirty two next year. You know Draymond Green. I saw Marcus Thompson tweet the other day. Draymond Green is out of that that core group of people. They call them the Hamptons Five: Durant, Iguodala, Curry, Draymond, and and Clay Thompson. Uh, Draymond's the youngest at twenty nine. And that's usually the type, the age when your body starts to, starts to, you know, go south. So they're going to get old very quickly. And if Durant goes to uh, leaves next year, as as is expected, you know, th th that's this fifty five win team in their sleep, they're going to be a different team, and they're going to have challenges. And you're not necessarily going to have the diehards to pull you through. Now I remember when the ownership team had uh, taken over the Warriors, yeah. and they came from, or a few of them came from, like a hedge fund. Uh, or tech world they are. management, yeah. yeah, yeah, and Lake is especially, and then Goober is the Hollywood guy, yeah, and so they came, they came, took over the Warriors and built a great dynasty. They did. Do you think it's something that they can keep doing down the road? Because many times it's not about putting together the All Star team like what Miami Heat did with right. LeBron, and uh, but but would they? Do you see? the possibility of them putting together a new, like a new dynasty, a new set of players, a new generation coming up. Eventually. Uh, I think there's going to be a valley, though, in between the two, between this dynasty and, and I mean, they're smart guys. Bob Myers is a great GM. Uh, Joe Lacob does a great job. Uh, they have a great, Steve Kerr is a great coach. I mean, they've got a great front office staff, as good as, as anything. But, you know, even great front office staffs have, have time, they need time to recoup. And to replan and to rebuild, um, you know, they didn't draft as great as that front office staff is. They didn't draft Steph Curry, you know. That was Larry Riley and, and Don Nelson. That was the previous regime hmm. that drafted Steph Curry. Now, if they don't draft Steph Curry, that's a very different team. Then you don't probably don't get Durant. Then you know, then Clay Thompson is great and Draymond's great, but they don't have Steph to give the ball to when. You know, you're down by three with eight seconds left. And you um, need someone to throw a three-pointer from the, <laughs> yeah, the, the yeah. midway, right? And Steph Curry's a dream. He's like, he's a, you know, not only is he one of the, he is the best shooter of all time. He And he's one of the best players of all time. Um, he's the most ego-free, down-to-earth, good PR-creating superstar probably in the history of the league. Um, and he's he's a once-in-a-lifetime player. So are you going to find another Steph Curry? Maybe. Probably not, <laughs> yeah. you know. Uh, and I always think about Al, Al Davis. Like from '63 to '85, there was no one smarter in sports than Al Davis. He got called a genius for 20 years, and he deserved most of the praise. Um, and then all of a sudden, he wasn't. And then the last 25 years of his career, he was an idiot, you know. Um, and uh, that's what people said anyway. And you know, his, a lot of his decisions. It was hard to argue with that perception too. So you know, I think, I think when you have a good track record for a very long period of time, a lot of people calling you a genius, you get caught up in your head, and then yeah, and then you, and then we, after a few bad decisions, you start making taking on too much risk. 
just to try to catch up to what your ego or what your legacy used to be. Yeah, that's a great that's a great comment. You, that kind of like I'll show you kind of move. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so I think the Warriors are, are I, they remind me of that of like you know the of the old Al Davis where you're a genius until you're not, and then um, you know. Joe Lacob, uh, you know, he's very committed. He's willing to spend the money. And that way he's, he's, a, he's a fan's dream. Uh, he hires great people. Uh, yet, I don't know if they're equipped to handle the comeuppance that is awaiting them in a couple of years to handle that with grace. Uh, because there is going to be a, t- a point where this, this group of people gets too old. And, um, you know, it's like that old story, you know, you're winning, you're winning, you're winning, you're drafting high every year, you know, oh, you don't have access to the best players, you're paying all these great players a lot of money, so you don't have a lot of cap room, there's going to be a period where they'll need to kind of flush it all out, a two, three, five year period. Mm-hmm. Um, they're capable of building an, another dynasty, but there's going to be a, a period of some, some down years, um, probably, you know, the mid 20s, the mid 2020s. You know, you wouldn't shock me to see the Warriors be 38 and 44, kind of like where the Lakers are now. Hmm. Very so, interesting. Yeah. What are the plans for Oracle Arena um, once you know, they leave? Well, yeah, uh, the the A's are trying to, to purchase that site concurrently with building at Howard Terminal. So what they've released are plans where they will – these are just their plans, right? So we'll see. Um but uh, first, they need to buy the buy the land from the city and county, and the city and county needs to agree to that. But if, if their plans are brought to fruition, they'll keep the arena and still hold it for concerts and stuff. Um, and then they'll turn the stadium. They'll sort of do to the Coliseum what San Francisco did to Keysar Stadium, this old stadium that used to hold you know NFL games and um, and soccer games, and and they'll just make it more of a community sort of park with a field, you know. Um, we'll see if that actually happens, but it's, it's not a bad idea. Like, especially with the arena, because, you know, Oakland could be a, a great convention town. Uh, and if you have like, I don't know, let's say the democratic national convention, you know, holding it there at that arena is a great, uh, would be a great location. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, Kamala Harris, when she announced that she's running for president, she didn't choose San Francisco where she worked most of her professional career. She chose Oakland because it had a better connotation, had a better story to broadcast to the rest of America's voters. Because San Francisco, fairly or not, has been painted a certain way so that the rest of the 49 states uh, in this country has a, they have a, a very distinct impression when they hear the word San Francisco. When they hear Oakland, they think, oh, blue collar. Yeah, it's blue and yeah, it's liberal, but it is a lot like us. You know, it's, yeah. a, it's a town that wins and loses and struggles. And, it's interesting you bring that up because yeah. there are a lot of articles that just simply bash Kamala Harris uh, even Gavin Newsom, simply mm. because of San Francisco. Right. Many times they just think San Francisco, too right. liberal, this and that, and right. automatically they go on a bashing rampage on an article. Yeah, that's true. So so the new stadium in San Francisco, um, the access to it, how's the access going to be? Because that's always a concern when they're right. building a new stadium. Right. I think they're going to eventually have a ferry stop there. I think, I think that's the goal. Uh, and that helps. But, um, you know, it, it's not easy to get even just to AT&T Park. Excuse me. It's called Oracle Park now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, uh, it's the fourth name in 19 years. Um, uh, so, you know, you, you take Barden from the East Bay and then you kind of have to walk. You know, in some ways it's clo- It's easier to get from downtown San Francisco to the Coliseum because of Bart than it is to do the, the reverse, to go from downtown Oakland to Oracle Park. Because, you know, it's just not that easy. Like, I think the, what the, the Caltrain goes there from the peninsula, that's – accessible and then you have um you have uh, some of the muni stops but really it can be difficult to, to come from the east bay i think so it's even harder to get even further south south of that lefty old dual bridge to where the chase center is going to be there is that third street line that's coming through um but um you know if it, it you have to transfer from bar you have to transfer from this other spot come if you're coming from the south it's going to be difficult and it's going to be held to drive i mean you need to be taking public transit um, so it remains to be seen, you know, how easy it's going to be to get there. I think it's going to be difficult. You do have that hospital Especially there. Especially when it coincides with the Oracle Park games. Yeah, so. yeah exactly. Yeah. We have that, uh, what that's, yeah, there's going to be in the springtime, especially there's going to be some, some, some coinciding games there. So coinciding events, concerts, that kind of thing. It'll be difficult. It won't be easy to get to. Yeah. Now with the Warriors, do you think Kevin Durant's staying or or is he leaving? I, I think he's gone. He's gone. Um, I really do. Um, because he just, 
his body language, I mean, it's nothing that anyone's told me, nothing that I've heard. But, man, has he been grumpy all year, <laughs> you know. Uh, for and it's only his third year here. I mean, he hasn't been here that long, and and it, you know, if, and it's interesting because the Bay Area media is known for being pretty soft and pretty hands on. Not soft; they, they all work hard and they're all good at their at their jobs. Um, there's some great writers uh, here in the Bay Area, but um, they're not like New York or Boston, where they will henpeck you or they'll just blast you. They don't. They rarely do that. And for him to get grumpy with Tim Kawakami or Monty Pool or other people during these press conferences that are pretty mundane questions, you know, um, it just seems to me that his body language and his, his attitude has been, you know, not necessarily poor, but just a, a guy that has one foot out the door. Mm-hmm. Do you um, think his little, uh, t- tussle with uh, Draymond earlier plays a role in his leaving or, you know, I think he was already gone. And I think that's, that's part of the reason why Draymond, f- uh, went, went hard back at him. Does he just nail? Yeah. He said, you know, you're yelling at me, you know, you're, you're, you're you got one foot out the door here and you know, uh, you know, you want you talk about commitment to this organization, you know. Um, so I think that that was part of the problem. And also, too, like I, part of me wondered, why is Kevin Durant yelling at Draymond Green about a game in November? You know, you guys just <laughs> you guys have just won two championships. You proved last year that the regular season doesn't matter that much. Who cares if you lose this game to the Clippers in, in late November or uh, December, whenever it happened? Why are you yelling at uh, this guy who's like the hardest working, smartest a teammate you're ever going to have at that point you understand that there's something else that happened yeah deeper yeah that that, most people don't know exactly yeah and it just seemed like like there's there's something in, in play there that that uh that is driving that so i do think he's gone i don't know if it's going to be the knicks but if he does go to new york and he thinks you know wait till the media gets a hold of him in new york working for the most dysfunctional franchise in the nba the knicks yeah um he may be in for rude awakening yeah well, it's funny you say that, like the comparison between East Coast and West Coast mm-hmm. and and um, the I guess the easiest way for me to explain it is just looking at baseball fans. If you if you go to a San Francisco Giants, even yeah. Oakland A's game and just sit there during a playoff game, everyone's sitting there having a good time, but enjoying the game. Right. right. You go to the East Coast. They're enjoying the game too, but at a much different level. Yeah, I mean, you have they're way more animated. They're yelling. Yeah. they're cheering. It's completely. It's it's polar opposites. Yeah, there, there's a there's a. Um, I spent a fair amount of time in the East Coast recently, and and there's a, there's definitely a tension to everyday life that I think lends itself to that edge at the ballpark. You know, have you ever spent a December in Boston? You know that there's just <laughs> you know that'll make you angry. You know, uh, and that'll put you in a bad mood. <laughs> and uh, so it, sometimes I think we see that at the ballpark. Yeah. So let's talk about the Oakland A's. Okay. And uh, for some of the younger viewers, what was the Coliseum like prior to the addition of Mount Davis? You know, this is a, this is interesting because, uh, well, I, I think what it was before, if, if, you, if you're too young to have experienced that, it was a um, a ballpark you could go to that was beautiful, and it was a dual ballpark that was beautiful, which was rare for any era. But you know, the sixties and seventies, and even the early eighties, ballparks were built in a way that you'd have football and ba- and and, and uh, baseball played there. And it was difficult to give it any charm. Football didn't really matter, but it was difficult to find a, a really charming dual use ballpark. Um, Oakland was one of the most charming dual use ballparks for baseball. Yeah, that. That green um, ivy plant on the outside, uh, it was sort of sunken into the ground, so it didn't look that big as you were walking in. Um, Billy St- Kenny Stabler for the Raiders used to call it a little old bull ring, uh, which is a weird thing to call a 55,000-seat stadium. But you could it kind of looked that way, particularly um, on the east side for football. There was just one section that went up, and there wasn't two or three decks on that on that east side. Um, and, uh, and, you know... Th- the ballpark for for baseball had bleachers, uh, and then it had these shot of the East Bay Hills that were just beautiful, like a day like today where it's sunny but the hills are green. Mm-hmm. You know, it was really hard to to match. And um, Ace fans loved it, especially. And um, I, you know, I was one of those guys. I love the Raiders until they move. I love the Raiders as much as the A's. Um, and so when they came back and they changed the stadium for it, I knew it wasn't ideal, but. Uh, it was a deal I was willing to make because, well, hey, we're getting the Raiders back. A wrong is being righted. You know, what could be bad about this? And what I didn't realize until years later and I talked to people 
uh, particularly people, people that just love the A's and didn't really care about the Raiders, was how much it angered A's fans that the bleachers, which really was the soul of the stadium, you know, you could get really close, kind of like, almost like Wrigley. You could get really close to the field and uh, talk to the players. And Dave Henderson, who played for the A's from 88 to 94, you know, had kind of a, a running commentary during during games. You know, they would chant to him and he'd flex back to them, you know, in, in between pitches. You know, they had a lot of fun. They had they sang happy birthday to him one, on his birthday one year and, and tried to present him a cake, you know. He's like, oh, the game's going on. I, you know, I can't take it. Um, you know, so the bleachers really were a beautiful thing at the Coliseum and the soul of the stadium. And that got destroyed when they came back. And even though I was, you know, willing to make that that trade, um, I, I am always kind of taken aback when I see other fellow Ace fans talk about that and how angry they get when they talk about it, particularly now that the Raiders are leaving. You know, we destroy the stadium and, and we do our damage like a hurricane and then we just blow on to the next town. That's messed up. Yeah. yeah. And so that's... Uh, I think the, the the bleachers are what, you know, if you're too young to have seen it, the bleachers were the soul, and it's gone. And it's part of the reason why, you know, the A's really need a new stadium. So that was the big decision behind, uh, uh, I guess, putting in those suites and the— Yeah, and Mount Davis. Yeah. The, the fourth the fourth deck, It was all for the Raiders. Yeah, it was all for the Raiders in 1995 when they came back. Uh, and it all happened very quickly, so people didn't really have a chance to chime in. Um, but it was done, and the, the idea was that the, the PSLs and, and the— for the bleachers and the suites would pay for the renovation and they fell short. You know, it wasn't a total disaster, but they fell short enough that it didn't, it, it didn't pay for everything. And that the city and the County had to chip in, you know, uh, a, a big chunk of change. I forget what the exact amount is. And they've, they've um, refinanced it. So um, I'm sure it's changed, but it, it, it ultimately it cost the taxpayers more than everyone wanted it to. So now the A's are looking for a new, stadium location yeah well they found the howard terminal they did but you said they're keeping options open at possibly even taking over the oracle arena stadium yeah that's part of their their um their proposal and their proposal really is i mean i suppose if, if they buy the coliseum land as they concurrently try to look at howard terminal it does two things one whatever they develop at the coliseum under the auspices of um the city planning document, which is, what's it called? The city plan or the, the Coliseum zoning plan. I forget the exact name, but you know, every city, you know, you know this in real estate, like mm -hmm. that every city has, they zone, right? And they, they create like a 20 year vision for the city and then also for each different zones. And so part of their, their vision for the, uh, I think it's 120 acres at the Coliseum complex, but there's 800 acres surrounding the entire area. Like it's kind of radius there in deep East Oakland. Um, is to have, you know, like X amount of office space, X amount of housing, affordable housing, market rate housing, X amount of park space, um, really like millions of square feet. And with that plan in mind, the A's want to develop the Coliseum in, in the ways that they want to develop it, while still hitting all those numerical marks for office space, housing, parks, etc. cetera. Um, and so they can either do that. So they, if they hold on to the Coliseum land, they can always build there as a third option. Um, or they could develop that land, use the profits to pay for, for you know, the expenses that's it, the very expensive costs of building a Howard Terminal. Now, where do you think would be a better location for? I, I mean, all day, every day, Howard Terminal. Okay. I would, I would. Uh, Howard Terminal was what I've wanted all along. My own personal. Nobody really asked me except for you. But but uh, <laughs> but uh, but Howard Terminal is, and, and even when they were building at Peralta, or they were trying to build at Peralta, you know, a year and a half ago. And that fell through for a variety of reasons. Uh, the whole time I'm like, well, it's not Howard Terminal, but I'll take it, you know. And I suppose that, that's how I would feel about the Coliseum. But I want, I think Howard Terminal is, a, is an awesome site. And, you know, not that you want, you know, it's not competing with the Giants, but it does give you um, some of those same benefits. It's got this beautiful waterfront. I mean, the Oakland waterfront is really underrated. It's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And those port cranes, which a lot of cities have them, you know, you can go to Brooklyn. You've got those port cranes on the, the port of Brooklyn in New York City. You go to Genoa, Italy. Um, not something we probably thought we'd discuss today, but you go to Genoa, Italy. It's, it's a lot like Oakland. It's a port town, a very kind of gritty port town, surrounded by beautiful, you know, towns and beachside towns in northern Italy. Uh, Oakland is like that. It's it's the gritty port town, surrounded by a lot of other beautiful spots. And Oakland has its own its own waterfront beauty. And Howard Terminal would really maximize that. I mean, just imagine the shots 
those those cranes silhouetted in the background at like 6 30 p.m it, it's something you know? about the oakland cranes that really give oakland like a lot of character yeah like it's, it's ports it's part of the icon like every city has its own iconic vistas you know yeah. I, mean, I mean in fact that's what uh that's what inspired george lucas to create those at hats in star wars or the cranes is that right yeah yeah, so, yeah, they just give a lot of character to Oakland. Sure. Yeah, it, it definitely. And, like, you, you drive by those or you see them from a distance. You're like, oh, that's Oakland. Yeah. Now, what about the hazardous and toxic cleanup waste over at Howard Terminal? Yeah, that's something, you know, that is, unfortunately, that's something that I have to do a lot more homework on. Um, I, I've, I've read the same articles you've read. Um, and that's, you know, some of the next articles or columns I do about, about Howard Terminal, I'm going to have to dive deeply into that. Um, what I've read, as you've read, I'm sure, is that they have some concerns and that it's been capped. Um, but the ACE, to their credit, have said this. They said, you know, whatever um, cleanup costs we're required to do, we're going to pay for them. And we're going to put, you know, kind of factor that into our stadium construction costs. Um, and uh, so they're, they're offering, and they're working with, uh, I forget the name of the group. It's a West Oakland environmental group, West Oakland community group that they've partnered with. Um to, you know, to dialogue with the community, to dialogue with the stakeholders and the neighbors in, in, in the area um, uh, in order to clean up that area, which I think is commendable. Um, you know, I, it, I, it's going to cost a lot of money. But I mean, when you're talking about building the stadium yeah. and the type of revenue and the big plus for them is that they're going to stay in Oakland, not like the Warriors going to San Francisco, yeah. the Niners going to Santa Clara. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. It's true. And I will say this, you know, the, the A's are saying for years – you know, it, for 20 years, really, uh, you had a commissioner in Bud Seedley who was trying to move the A's out of Oakland. He brings in a, his old fraternity brother, Lou Wolf, to move the A's out of Oakland. Guess what? Lou Wolf tries to move the A's out of Oakland to Fremont first, then to San Jose. Um, and uh, and so for years, as an A's fan, you're like, we're going to lose this team. You know, I remember that Fremont. That was so weird. Out of all places, Fremont. Yeah, Fremont A's. <laughs> yeah, and Fremont's a great place, but the, the location was crazy. I mean, it wasn't near any public transit. Uh, it was uh, traffic. And traffic's already horrendous through 880 corridor there, between Oakland and, and, and San Jose, and you're gonna add to it 81 days a year. It was it never made any sense to me, and, and thankfully it fell through. Um, with apologies to my friends in Fremont, uh, <laughs> and I've got a few. Um, but um, but uh, I, I do think it's it's crazy that um, I mean I, I don't know. I, I guess my point that I was talking about about Seeley and Wolf is that is that finally we have a situation. We have Commissioner Manfred now, the new commissioner saying yeah oakland is a great is a great baseball town we want to stay in oakland it's like heaven to an ace fan's ears after years of thinking man the game has just been rigged against us you've got dave cavill now replacing lou wolf saying the opposites of, of what lou wolf said we want to stay in oakland we're rooted in oakland we're going to build a whole advertising campaign about that and we want to we're going to build we're going to not take any money from the city and county we're going to uh, you know it's going to be all on our own dime maybe some some uh uh, infrastructure costs, but that's normal for any project. Um, so it, it's all sort of lined up uh, in the ways that an ACE fan wanted it to line up for decades. Um, and uh, I just hope that everyone has the political will to, to, to take it over the finish line. I think a waterfront uh, a ballpark with waterfront views mm -hmm. would be a great way to kind of make up for Mount Davis and ruining that view. Yeah. Right. I think that's a great point. You know, it's yet you, you years where you, you know, you felt the sneer coming from San Francisco. Like, Oh, that's your ballpark. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and now you can sort of have somewhat of an equal footing. Yeah. J just for the record, as a Giants fan, I have always enjoyed going to the Coliseum, <laughs> but I, I know I'm in a very small minority there. I, I still find yeah. the Coliseum enjoyable. Yeah. Because you're a true fan. Like the, the game is the yeah. game, right? Yeah. Well, also I'm a huge fan of the tree house. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There we go. That, <laughs> that, that bar scene out there is one of the best things I've ever seen in a ballpark. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah, when you have when you're when you're like just a fan of the game, mm -hmm. many times it really doesn't matter where you watch it. I mean, yeah. it literally could be a feel like the Sandlot. Like yeah. you really don't care. You're there to watch the game and enjoy it. Yeah, no, I think it's a great point. And for football especially, like you know, I guess I'll editorialize here and I'll but I've never understood for baseball I understand because it's pastoral, there's eighty one games. You know, you're not always there for the game. You'll walk around, you'll take in the views, you know, you don't even need to watch every pitch hang out with your children. But for football, football, it's just three hours. And it's it's most NFL stadiums, it's an R-rated experience. You know, you're not there for to take in the sunshine and to <laughs> sip the wine. It's you're there to watch football. And it's 
it's a it can be a it's a violent game, obviously. And you know, you have the tailgates, you go in, you watch the game, you leave. I've tried to stick around more than fifteen minutes after a game, and there's it's so heavily policed that people are like, "Get him out!" Like I've seen, I've seen, <laughs> really? I've seen the yeah. the um, plainclothes police officers. I don't know if it's FBI or what. I, I, <laughs> I, you know, I'm I, after the Raiders have given you a lot of reason to slump in your chair after a game, and 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 there was a game after that I did that. I was just sat there thinking, "How'd they lose this game?" I'm just gonna <laughs> I'm just gonna sit here and just think about it for a minute, and then fifteen minutes go by, and I could see the cops go, "Get him out!" And I was just sitting there. You know, so, you know, it, it, when people say, oh, we need a brand new stadium, it needs to be nice. My question would be, why? Why Why, why would, why does this, particularly a city, need to spend a billion dollars on a new stadium so I, the fan, can pay a hundred bucks or two hundred bucks or it's probably more these days to just sit there for three hours and then get kicked out if I really do want to enjoy it and stick around for a little bit. I think it's it's the biggest waste of all time. And I think one of the problems that the Oakland Raiders had, you have a lot of people that show up to tailgate yeah. and never go into the ballpark. Oh, really? I, I didn't experience yeah, that, really. Like a big significant peop- hmm. number of people go just to uh, tailgate. Okay. And if, if you go on the Instagram. Well, because the tailgate experience was usually more fun than the game experience. <laughs> that's, true. True, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I remember reading an article where um, I forgot who was quoted in saying this in that hey, our own fans are not coming out and spending money. Mm. So we got to look at other avenues. Mm. And that was one of the reasons why they started looking at Las Vegas and really other cities. But they landed in Las Vegas. I was actually recently in Vegas and stayed across from uh, or nearby where they're building a new stadium. Now, I guess that new stadium is also having delays in being built, right? I've I've heard that I've heard that that they think that it's it's uh, it's possible that they're not going to make it to the 2020 season, and which is one of the reasons why why they've <laughs> they've added the option uh, if this deal goes through in the negotiations that so it's possible that the Raiders will be here for two more years oh, this fall <laughs> and 2020, uh, but we'll see we'll see you know in August of 2020, uh, which is about 18 months from now we'll. The proof will be in the pudding. I guess they were shopping around to see where they can rent stadiums. They were exactly thinking about renting from the yeah. Chargers or Stanford. And- yeah, yeah, and they looked everywhere. Um, they were in, and every day. I looked in the in, looked in the paper, and there were Tucson, Birmingham, um, uh, and yeah, this isn't new. I remember in nineteen eighty. I remember listening to the radio in nineteen eighty one, and Raiders of the Lost Ark had just come out, and you know, this is back when KFRC was still a rock station, and um, and. Uh, the DJ was making jokes about Raiders of the Lost Park. Uh, that was 38 years ago. So this this wandering eye of of a Davis owner um, losing games and um, being a dysfunctional franchise that really likes to pound its chest and say, well, "This is what how badass we are," while they really are just a you know. Uh, a dysfunctional model on legs. Um, That's a nice way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> is it's not new. It's been going on for thirty eight years, and you know they haven't they haven't won a Super Bowl in thirty five years. So I think there's a correlation there between this predilection they they started to have thirty five forty years ago about having constantly having a wandering eye and never committing to a community uh, that dovetails with the the this once great proud franchise falling by the wayside and never really adequately picking itself back up. Yeah, I, I feel like with the proper ownership and management, the Raiders would be able to get up back to the top so quickly because one of the things they have is just the brand itself, the black and silver. I mean, yeah. there's people all over the uh, nation, even in the world. You see people wearing Raider colors right. and Raider jerseys like elsewhere. And they love the Raiders because – they look badass, right? right They're right. the badass Raiders. And, right. and um, black and silver, people just love that. And when I was in Vegas, I went to the Mandalay Bay. Mm-hmm. They already have like hardcore uh, Raider fans that are dressed up as if they were going uh, to sit in the black hole. Right. And they're already there signing autographs, doing all kinds of things. Like Vegas, of course, with all their shows and productions, they're already putting the Raiders out there. Right. Um, I, I would imagine it's it would be so easy with just proper team management to really just bring them back up to the top. Yeah, I mean, I think that that uh, 
you know, I think the Warriors uh, are a great example, and the, the the Boston Red Sox are a great example. Where they were, the Red Sox were owned for decades by I, I think the Sullivan family. Um, they were owned by a family. Um, uh, God, I forget their last name, but anyway, it might have been the Yockeys. Uh, but uh, they were. Everyone talked about the curse of the Bambino. Well, all of a sudden, they've won four championships in the last fifteen seasons. What happened to that curse? You know, mm-hmm. all it was was that you had a kind of a a crony loving family like a lot of families they had their dysfunctions and their problems uh and uh that infected the way they, they did business you know they had a chance to sign willie mays in the early 50s and they didn't because they were too racist you know they were the last team to integrate uh you know i think they integrated 12 years after jackie robinson joined the brooklyn dodgers so they were uh uh you had this kind of very flawed family running the organization in a very flawed way and so they didn't win you know, it really was that simple. You bring in a really good owner um, uh, named uh, John Henry uh, and uh, Larry Lucchino and other people. And they, they hired great people like Theo Epstein before he went to the Cubs. And what do you know? They've won four championships in 15 years and they've outperformed the Yankees. So it's a similar thing with, with, the, with the Raiders. You have the Davis family. God bless Al Davis. He did a lot of great stuff. He did a lot of bad stuff. And he raised, um, I don't think he prepared his son to take over. And I don't know how you do that. I don't know how you raise a child. Even if you're not close to that child, how do you give him the reins and not prepare him for that? You're damaging your son and the franchise, which mm-hmm. he probably loved more than his son, if we can be honest. Um, well, you see that in a lot of uh, businesses yeah. where where the parent who owns a business passes away and their entire dream was to pass it on to their kids. Right. But they never prepared their kids to properly yeah. run the business. Yeah. And the New York Knicks are going through the same thing with uh, James Dolan. He's the son of a billionaire, and he's wholly uh, ill-equipped to run that franchise. And it shows in the results. They have the worst record in basketball again. So it's, it's the same thing with the Raiders and, and with the Davises. And I think, uh, you know, we talked about how the Warriors are in for a rude awakening in in San Francisco. I, I think that Las Vegas is going to be the mother of all debacles in professional sports business. Uh, I think it's going to be a total disaster really? for the Raiders. And uh, uh, I I don't think their fan base is as big as they think it is. I think the Los Angeles years from 82 to 94 proved that. I heard every uh, seat, every seat's going to have like a slot machine. Really? Is that, <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, th- you may have to make money God, that way. Yeah, God, make money <laughs> right. Now. Right. And that's, that distracts from the game. I, I read what they were, they were touting the whole thing about being served. You're going to be served by like a waiter will come to you. And, you know, I, I don't know. Is that what the NFL is supposed to be about? A waiter or a cocktail waitress. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> Knowing Vegas. Right. Uh, to me, those are all distractions. Whereas the, the great thing about Raider fans in Oakland and the great thing about the Oakland Coliseum experience and even Candlestick is that it was just all about the football. Didn't matter if you were playing on a pile of glass in an alleyway. You know, you were there to watch football. And that's one of the great things about it. If you want to be pampered, I mean, we've got plenty. You've got hotels. You have country clubs. Why do we need to have a, a pampered experience at a, at a football stadium? Yeah, that's really not, I, I not what think, the game is supposed to be about. Yeah, I think if you focus on the fans, though, that – just truly love the game. Yeah, there's only so much money you can, you know, extract from that because at the right. end of the day, you're a business, right? Right. But then when you start adding experiences to it, there are a lot of people that will pay some big money for right. experiences, right? And so you start to see a lot of like MLB. I mean, if mm-hmm. you look at the viewership of MLB and how it's really dropped and right. people attending, you know, one of the problems that have really held them back is the fact that. Uh, they try to control everything that's out there right. about MLB, any of the teams, any of the games, any clips. Right. Whereas if you look at what the NBA has done, it's completely different. Right. And I mean, if you just go look at NBA games and how the fans are, it's completely different. And you have a lot of fans that were not NBA fans even 10 years ago. Right. And, I, and that's where I think NBA is doing great. But then MLB, uh, even NFL, they're kind of like in the middle. They need to focus more, a little bit more on the actual experience for the fans because, right. and and I think that's where they're, what they're trying to do. Yeah. But fans are not really expecting to be pampered. They just want a fun experience, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's like going to the bowl game. What you mentioned, you take your family out there, you walk around, you you maybe watch half the game like from your seat, right. but then the other half you're walking around enjoying the experience, right. uh, enjoying the other fans that are really into it. Right. It comes down to experience. Yeah. 
yeah. for most people, I think. It's a good point, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I mean, you don't think it's going to work out for them in Vegas, though? So. I don't. I don't. I think um, I think they're they're going to sell a number of tickets. Um, I don't think they're going to sell enough. I don't think they're going to sell enough PSLs. I think it's going to mirror what the Los Angeles years were like, where you had a two-thirds filled stadium, um, a number of which were Raider fans, a number of which were the other team's fans. Um, I, I, I think they were also banking on people from the Bay Area to fly out to Vegas right. to watch the games because right. Bay Area people apparently have all the money. Right? Well, another concern I've heard is what kind of home field advantage are they going to have there? Because Vegas, I mean, it's the ultimate getaway weekend. It's exactly right. So, I mean, it's exactly right. If you have a if you have a, a six and nine Raiders team or a six and eight Raiders team, and they're playing a game in December in the cold, which Vegas can get cold in December, um, and it's around the holidays when you really kind of need to stay close to home and go shopping with your wife and you know get ready for Christmas. Uh, what kind of what kind of attendance are they going to have when it's the Cleveland Browns against the Oakland uh, Las Vegas Raiders to see this team that you know the season's really over? It's going to be interesting too because it, yeah. it just snowed in Vegas this past December. Right, <laughs> right, yeah, yeah right. It's going right. to be a snowy city yeah. in, in December. Yeah, and it's interesting. Like you mentioned, the the money here in the Bay Area that they were banking on people from flying from here to there, and you know if there's a lot of money here in the Bay Area, and there undeniably is, you know how can you not tap into that? Why would you not want to tap into that? Stay here. You know? Yeah, my concern is, and where I think that uh, that theory was flawed. Is that if you look at, and this is uh, from my real estate, just mm -hmm. analyzing real estate data. If you look at domestic migration, more people are moving out of the Bay Area than moving in. Mm. But what's the reason that's keeping population up and the demand up in the Bay Area is you have a lot of foreigners moving in. Mm. Because you have San Francisco, Silicon Valley that are two big global world hubs. Right. So close together. And Silicon Valley is like the mecca if you want to be a startup company, yeah. right? Yeah. And so you have so many foreigners moving into the Bay Area, right. domestic migrations moving out. Um, and they're moving out to different areas like Oregon, Washington, Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see them capturing a lot of people from the Bay Area because you have a lot of foreigners that are coming in. They don't really watch football. They don't really track football. I mean, football for them is soccer, right? And then actual American football, you have some, but not many yeah. people. I'm sure there'll be some that kind of discover it and follow along. But then your domestic migration, they move out. They're going to be too far away to really fly to Vegas for Raider games. Oh, well, yeah, I definitely think that that no one's going to – not enough people are going to fly to Vegas. You know, it's, it's too expensive. You know, um, no matter how much money you're making. But I do think that even even if, if people are coming in from other countries, you know, today's today's outsiders, tomorrow's American. You know, I mean, I know that in the 1920s, people probably said the same thing about about my grandparents. Um, and, you know, uh, next thing you know, you blink and Joe DiMaggio is playing for the Yankees and Tony Lazari and Frankie Crisetti and, uh, you know, Dario Lota Johnny is playing for the Philadelphia A's. And so, you know, you do have... I'll just use the Italian American experience as an example, and my relatives as an ex uh, my grandparents as an example, where maybe they weren't big baseball fans when they came over here, but shortly they were, you know, and it's because they could look at, at a Joe DiMaggio and a, and a Frank Crisetti and say, yeah, you know, I identify with this sport, you know. So I think that's kind of the what you're describing, sort of the natural order of America, you know. Yeah, and there are solutions to it. Do you think there's at any point? A chance where the Raiders could scratch Vegas and just stay in Oakland. Well, that I I think that I think that there's the lawsuit that has been filed, and the first court date is uh, March 22nd coming up in San Francisco. Uh, I, I don't think that they can scratch it because the thing has been you know built, but I do think that there is a possibility. I think there's a possibility that Mark Davis will lose the team. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you guys caught this. Jason Cole had a really interesting column. Last week where he – it's interesting. Sports is writing is an interesting thing because sports writers can get away with doing things that other other areas can't. He, he spoke vaguely about NFL owners that he'd been talking to that are alarmed that, that they didn't have a plan B for the stadium. You know, they said that – so basically what happened, let's recap very quickly. The lawsuit got filed in December. Mark Davis and Mark Bedane was, were very angry about that lawsuit being filed. They were stunned reportedly. Which, and the whole point of Jason Cole's column was that they shouldn't have been stunned. Everyone knew that this was coming, or at least it was a possibility that this was coming. Um, and uh, 
And so, but they didn't have a plan B for it. They weren't ready for it. Which if you have a two and a half billion dollar company that can just mint money the way an NFL team can with not that much effort, um, you should have a plan B. You're not that busy, you know? <laughs> um, and and they didn't have a plan B. And so they got pissed. And they, that's why they were searching all over, all over the globe, it seemed, for a new home until they realized circumstances forced them. You got to go back to the Coliseum for a year mm -hmm. uh, or two. Um, and here we are, March 11th, and they still don't have an official deal. There's going to be a, there's going to be a, a preseason game in five months in Oakland, ostensibly, but they don't have a deal yet. You know, I got a phone call from a ticket rep saying, "Well, just call us back and we'll call you in April." In case wow. I, and I'm like, "Well, you know, people start making plans, man. Like yeah. April's pretty late in the game, um, so it'll be interesting to see what the Coliseum is like is like next year." But to, to get back to your question uh, about about the future of the team, I do think that the league is is uh, very alarmed at the, the in the kind of dysfunctional and incompetent way that Mark Davis is running the team. I think that they will the leash is getting shorter on him. And um, I do think that this lawsuit now the lawsuit isn't asking for the name, logo, and colors of the Raiders, but the damages, the damage settlement could be so high that the city and county can say, okay, you owe us I don't even want to speculate. You owe us a lot of money, and but we'll knock it down a little bit if you name if you leave the name, logo, and colors here. You take your team to Vegas, and you can be the Las Vegas, whatever you want to call it, the Gamblers, whatever. Then you can go restart the XFL. Yeah, right, <laughs> right, right. And then they can do what Cleveland did in the '90s when Art Modell moved his Cleveland team to Baltimore. He had to rename them the Ravens, and then a year or two later, a new Cleveland Browns started. Uh, that's a possibility, and that's a goal of the people who really spearheaded the lawsuit. Mm. Yeah, that's a fact. And so uh, it's a long shot that that's going to happen, but it's a possibility, and it's one of the ideas that's out there. It's very interesting. I, I think a lot – I would imagine a lot of uh, Bay Area people would love keeping the Oakland Raiders here locally and let a new team, new ownership develop out of it. I think that that would be wonderful. It really would be. You, you know, know send I mean, Mark Davis to Vegas with a big old egg on his face too, which I think a lot of Raiders fans would enjoy. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So um it's all about uh it's all about I think it would be a great thing. And it would be, you know, it'd be really ironic because Al Davis lived in a courtroom for you know, he was either at the stadium or a courthouse. <laughs> you know, he was that's how many lawsuits he, he filed. Um and he was successful in the eighties with his lawsuits, not so much in the nineties and the two thousands. But um, he kept trying. So it would be really – and he even took over the team really through a legal maneuver in the early 70s. So uh, – and almost like a hostile takeover uh, that we don't have time to delineate now. But if, <laughs> if he uh, – if he if for his son to lose the team in a legal maneuver would be the ultimate irony, you know? Yeah. So what was your most memorable moment in East Bay sports history? There's so many. Uh, my God. Uh I'll give you one for each team, you know. Um, I think uh, – oh, let me think for a second here. Even though it was a uh, – I think the first two games of the 89 World Series, which I went to at the Coliseum, um, uh, no offense to any, to any Giants fans, but, uh, <laughs> but it was just to, to, to see them – that team was such a juggernaut, and they were cruising, and they just crushed them in those first two games, and the – to see uh, coming off the bitterness of the 88 World Series and how that ended. It was just, it was so much fun to see. Um, so uh, there's that. I think for 89, you know, this is just, for, I mean, for, for the Warriors, I should say, um, there were, going to see like Chris, run TMC play for me. I'm, I'm of that age. Uh, they weren't as good as, as the current Warriors. But they were just so much fun to watch, and they were so unlikely. And Nelson was always tinkering, like putting Manute Bull out on the point guard and shooting three-pointers or putting Terry, Terry Teagle on a seven-footer. Terry Teagle was like 6'5 uh, on defense. Um, but my own personal memory, I remember uh, 91, 91, 90, somewhere in there, I bought a ticket the day before the game. This shows you how things have changed. And I, I sat a row behind the, the, the Supersonics bench. There was, there was a Supersonics back then for 20 bucks. We sat behind the, the, the Sonics wow. bench day before the game. And it was so much fun. And, and the Warriors won playing this, you know, the, the, the weird style of ball I just described. Um, and I remember at the end of the game, they played, uh, they played an Aretha Franklin song, which was maybe seemed like a, a minor detail. But 
uh, it just seemed like this was a strange, this was a very East Bay thing. This is a very Oakland thing. They're playing, you know, the Queen of Soul. They're playing this funky team. Um, and it's, uh, I could get a ticket like that and still have a great seat. It just seemed all very accessible and fun and a little bit offbeat. And to me, that's Oakland sports, you know? It was the experience. Yeah. 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 yeah you're right. Um, so who would you put on your Mount Rushmore of East Bay athletes? That's a great question. Um, I'm going to give you a whole bunch, but, um, <laughs> uh, um, for that, for just the overall, I'm going to go with Steph Curry, uh, Ricky Henderson, um, Ken Stabler. And then I'm going to, I'm going to go, I, I thought about, I, I've been thinking about Dave Stewart, like he'd be great there, but I'm going to put Kurt Flood because he was an Oakland, um, high school star. And he also, uh, but he changed sports and he was, he played for this, for the St. Louis Cardinals, but I don't know if you're familiar with his story, but he basically invented free agency. I mean, and he paid a price for it. You know, uh, the league really, uh, the MLB, he got traded to Philadelphia and he didn't want to go to Philadelphia. Philadelphia at the time was known for being, uh, an organization that let's, uh, let's just say was not friendly to African-American ballplayers and he didn't want to go. And he said, hey, I, I've, this is America. I should be allowed to choose where I hang my hat of employment. Uh, and it dovetailed a lot with the free agent, free agent movement that the, the Players Association head, Marvin Miller, who was a genius, um, was, was really trying to spearhead. So he took it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And this was a time in the early 70s where a lot of things were getting changed. You know, that, that kind of the wave of the 60s in all aspects of society was just upending the natural order of things. Um, and he barely lost. It's the closest. He took on uh, MLB and he tried to get rid of the, um, I got what's it called? I'm blanking on the name. The, uh, um, uh, it was the reserve clause he was trying to get rid of for free agency. Um, the antitrust exemption that MLB has, that's what he was trying to get rid of. There's been multiple attempts. The most recent was San Jose trying to get rid of it. And the Supreme Court came the closest it's ever gotten to, to, to doing that. He lost by five to three. Uh, and and uh, he got blackballed from baseball as a result of it. And, uh, uh, but to me, that's like the most Oakland thing you can do. He, he was, he had, he was factually right. He was morally right. And he punched above his weight. Um, so Kurt Flood is, that's a long winded <laughs> fourth person that goes on, but I'm going to do one for each, each, each team. Is that cool? Yeah, that's, that's cool. For the Raiders, I'll do, uh, let's do Stabler, Jim Otto, Gene Upshaw, and, um, I'm going to say Willie Brown. And for the Warriors, I'll do uh, Mullen, Steph Curry, uh, and then uh, Draymond Green and Clay Thompson. Uh, and uh, for the A's, it'll be Dave Stewart, Ricky Henderson, Catfish Hunter, and Reggie Jackson. With Vita Blue, very close. When you break it down like that, you realize how many amazing players across like all Bay Area sports have actually played here. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, you know, and we could we could do. Tiers. We do the second team, the third team, the fourth team for every sport, for every every team. You know, we've been very lucky in the short amount of time. You know, for San Francisco and Oakland. But um, yeah, uh, and you ask someone else, they'll have their own set of yeah idols, right? Yeah. And it's yeah, yeah, it's really a lot of amazing people that have played in the yeah. sports here in the Bay Area. You could do Rick Barry and Nate Thurmond and Al Adels. I mean, you could do a whole other level of Warriors and. Uh, for a team that didn't, for a franchise that didn't have a lot of winning up until about 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, and you could do that for the A's and the Raiders too. Yeah. So Chris, I want to thank you for coming on to the podcast. Yeah, thank you. It's been a fun episode uh, talking about Bay Area sports and uh, uh, wish you the best at East Bay Express and uh, look out for your next column. Yeah, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. Thank you to our producer, Sam Lemon. Please subscribe, like, comment, and share the podcast. Remember, you can listen to the podcast on iTunes, Podbean, iHeartRadio, Google Play, SoundCloud, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. For more information on my business as a property manager and real estate team, go visit my website at markguzman.com. I really, really want to thank all of you for listening. It means the world to me, and I hope today's episode provides you value in your day-to-day -day life. I created this podcast to help showcase the many great people that live in this world and help share some knowledge that I've learned along the way in life. Again, thank you for listening. 
check out our sponsors and I'll catch you on the next episode.